leaving, I did say that our, our theme of this series is Grace Poured Out. The title of this message is, If You But God, He's Going to Butt You Back. It's right there in the book of Jonah that I've read this morning. I was standing in line at the grocery store a couple of weeks ago, and the people in front of me were talking about the tablo- tabloids that you see in, in those lines all the time. You look at those, the cover of those magazines, and you find broken relationships, uh, divorces, um, r- drug addictions, ruined lives. Tabloids tell us a very important truth about sin and how it works. We all have this craving to be significant. We all have this craving to feel worth and have security in our lives. Having fame and fortune, we all wonder what that would be like in our lives, but having it also brings forth uh, sinful attractions. People long to go to Hollywood and have fame. I think it would be different for us. But more often than not, their lives head in the very same direction. They head, they head to ruin and destruction, just like the stars that predated them. One of the lessons of those tablets is this, that every train has a destination. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it, its end leads to destruction. That's what Jonah was facing. He was on a train that led to destruction unless God pursued this man and brought him back into the fold. Jonah's really a very familiar story to most of us. In fact, it's a book of only four chapters. You probably could read the entire book by the time I finish this message. It really is a simple story. It's about a man running away from God and God pursuing this man and bringing him back into the fold. It's about Jonah boarding a boat that's bound for a different direction that would lead to ruin for Jonah as sin always does. This is a story about sin and about grace. Now, the words sin and grace are familiar to most of us, if not all of us, as they were to Jonah, but they can take on an altogether new meaning as we grow in this. It is one thing to know the doctrine of grace. It's quite another to know the grace that the doctrine talks about. Jonah knew God's grace intellectually, but was challenged inwardly to embrace it. He was a prophet. As a prophet, he knew all about God's grace, but it was only through this experience that he began to embrace it. Sinclair Ferguson talks about Jonah's experience in these terms. It is really, Jonah is really a book about how one man came through painful experience to discover the true character of the God whom he had already served in the earlier years of his life. In other words, he was able to find uh, the doctrine about God, which he, which, which he had long been familiar, come alive in this experience. Now, when you think of Jonah, the first thing most of us think of, or many of us think about, is that famous fish that swallowed him. We ask, how could a fish swallow him? How could he stay alive for three days? Interesting questions, but they're really incidental to this book. For this book brings us face to face with the important issues like it, God's grace for the wicked, God's sovereignty over nature and our day-to-day struggle with forgiveness and repentance. Sinclair Ferguson summarizes the book this way. The book of Jonah is not so much about this great fish that appears in the middle of the book, but in order to teach Jonah that he has a gracious God. Now, you may be thinking, why Jonah? Why now? Remember, our theme this year at our church is the word befriend. From John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. We are called to be a light to those around us, to befriend our neighbors, to befriend our co-workers, to befriend even our enemies, and to love them into the kingdom. Jonah is called by God to carry a message of grace to the sworn enemy of Israel. It is a book that reminds us that it is our duty to be messengers of grace no matter who we in, come in contact with in life. It's a perfect book to look at in the season we are at at Redeemer. We all know what's happening to our society. We, know, we all see the decay of values, the issue of same-sex attraction, the issue of immigration, the, all these issues that we're smacked in the face with on a day-to-day basis. So many of us are asking, how do I deal with those issues? They're in my family now. How do I deal with them? It was no different in Jonah's day. Jonah was a prophet who lived some 800 years before the birth of Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, what makes Jonah kind of a fascinating book to look at is this. In all the other prophetic books, we get the message predominantly of the prophet, but in this book, we get his story. 
We get to see his failure. We get to see his struggles. This book should show and encourage us because it shows us that God uses broken failures to spread his message of grace. So many of us feel like there's no way I hope I can love my neighbor because he sees what a mess I am at home, how much I've screwed up. But look how the grace of God intervened in Jonah's life. You ever been surprised by the grace of God? When you've blown it big time and someone extends grace into your life? Jonah got to the point where he was stunned by the very grace of God. A true story that happened in South Africa many years ago now, a, a police officer ended up in a courtroom where he was confronted with the atrocities he committed in the apartheid era. In this courtroom sat a woman, and she was called to testify, and this woman got up, and, and this woman, this police officer, had burned her husband to death as well as her one and only son. She's called to testify against this cop, and she looks at him in the face and says, I declare forgiveness on this man. The courtroom was stunned. Then she went on to say, I ask only one thing from this man, that he comes to my house one day a month, and I get to, he allows me to be his mother, because I'm no longer a mother. I want him to be my son. If he will do that, I will grant him full forgiveness. True story. The policeman was so stunned, he literally fainted in the courtroom. Then in this courtroom in South Africa, several years ago, they began to sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You ever been stunned by the grace of God? This morning we do look at this book, Jonah. Grace poured out. So take out your sermon outline. Three quick points for us this morning as we look at this book. First, notice the call of grace. The call of grace. Jonah was a prophet. And as a prophet, he was to take God's message to him and communicate it with his people. Listen to what God told him to do in Jonah 1, 1 and 2 again. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. To Jonah, those were marching orders. He was a prophet from God. He was to go to Nineveh. This is the kind of command that a prophet might expect to receive. The summons to confront the wicked with their sin. God had decided to break in to do something about the wickedness of man. But in that first verse, we actually see the surprising nature of grace, which leads to a question. If Jonah was a prophet of God, if he understood what sin is and what grace is, why did he respond the way he did? Why did he react so violently against God in this situation? Jonah did know what most people do not know, that when God calls us to face our sin, when he calls us to repentance, his purpose is to shower us with his mercy and his grace and save us from our sin. Jonah knew from the very start of this journey, he suspected God's purposes were for the people of Nineveh. But think with me honestly of what God was asking Jonah to do. Jonah thought throughout his ministry, his ministry was to be the people of Israel. He was to be a prophet to the Jews. But now God was asking him to go to Assyria, to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. The Assyria was the reigning empire of the day, the sworn enemy of Israel. Nineveh was a city that comprised of over 120,000 people at the time. It had a city with walls over 100 feet high, and they were so thick you could drive chariots three abreast each other around the walls. And God says to Jonah, I have noticed that Nineveh has done great evil, and I have compassion for them. Add to this that Jonah was from northern Israel, close to modern-day Iraq, close to the Syrians. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and a place of incredible violence and evil. I am not exaggerating one bit when I could say that Nineveh was the modern-day ISIS, the terrorists of the day. They were known for their torture, for their dismembering, even decapitating of their enemies. So you have to realize that what God was asking Jonah to do was a pretty monumental task. Can you imagine being called by God in the middle of World War II to walk into Berlin and tell the Nazis to repent of their sin? What are the chances of that happening? From the, from the best human perspective, the, the best outcome would be that they, he would be mocked or ridiculed, run out of town. At worst, he would be caught, tortured, and killed. This is what Jonah was asked to do. This is what makes God's grace scandalous. These are the people that God had regard for. These are the people that God had compassion for. The implications of this truth are enormous. The heart of God is not simply for the people who are like us, not for simply good church-going people. No, he has a heart for the nations. The call of grace is much bigger than we are, much bigger than our church is, much bigger than our denomination is. 
do you have this sense of call of God on your life that you would go to broken, fallen people and proclaim to them the truths of Scripture? The heart of God is quite shocking. His surprising grace for the lost is mind-boggling. As a pastor, I hear all the time, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Where should I go to college? Whom should I marry? What kind of job should I have? Where should I live? Excuse me, this is God's will for your life. That you would take the balm of the gospel that you've experienced and take it to broken, hurting people within the walls of this church and outside the walls of this church. That means that, Redeemer, you take it to your place of work, that you take it to your school, that you would take it to your athletic field, that you would take it to your home, to your family. It means that you're willing to befriend, there's that word again, those who are not like you, that that your hope is that they one day would come to faith in Jesus. It could be that later on today when you go to lunch after church, that you share the good news with your waiter in your restaurant. That's why you're alive. Many of us say it's the preacher's job, it's Pastor Craig's job, it's the elder's job. Maybe it's time we stop running away from this. Look at what God did with Jonah. He was a prophet of God, but he had not yet comprehended the the total amazing grace of God. One of the best ways for us to experience it in this room is to take the grace of God in our lives and spread it to other people. Jonah's devotion to the nation of Israel, having seen how God had blessed Israel, how God had bestowed love upon Israel, his desire should have been motivated by that to take the message of love and grace to his neighbor. We love because he first loved us, right? It's the call of grace. God does the same with us. Now, I know this is not an easy thing. Sometimes God looks in our lives and says, I want you to do something that's so ridiculous, it looks suicidal from the human perspective. He just tells Jonah to go. Contrast Jonah with Abraham. When God asked Abraham to take his only son Isaac up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him on the altar, what did Abraham do? He he did what Jonah would not do. He took the very refuge in the nature of, of God. He knew that God had his best interest at heart. When God came to Abraham, he trusted that God would take care of him. When when Jonah, when God went to Jonah and received his marching orders, he trusted in his own wisdom and his own feelings. Those are only the two responses you can have when God asks you to do something. When's the last time God asked you to do something that seemed crazy or silly? Do you tend to respond in the way of Jonah or Abraham? Do you honestly take refuge in who God is, saying, I'm going to trust you in this situation, though it seems crazy, though the world laugh at me, though I lose my job, I'm going to place my trust in you? Or do you refuse to make a decision, paralyzed by anxiety, and in essence let God just pass you by, or you do what Jonah did and said, I'm going to go in the exact, exact opposite direction? Some of us are here and we live lives of lies. We know we have these hidden sins that are got a hold of our hearts and we're not willing to let them go. The call of grace on your life this morning is when are you going to stop running from God? When are you going to place your trust in his character? Trust that he has your best intentions at heart. It is quite one thing to know about the grace of God and sing about the grace of God, but to know the grace of God in your life firsthand. A few weeks ago I met with a lady whom I knew, um, I've known for like 30, 40 years now, who was a vibrant member of one of the churches I served. She was involved in it. She loved people well. In short, her life revolved around the community of God's people. Then she went through this huge crisis of faith that got so bad she walked away from the church and said for the, the next couple of decades, she said she no longer believed in God. We got together a few weeks ago, and she says she now believes once again. She's involved in her church once again, but she was struggling with something. She said, you don't know what I've done when I walked away from God. I went the other direction. I got in a boat like Jonah and went the opposite direction. And through her tears, she said, how do I know that God will accept me back? I've rejected him for so many years. How can I ever get back in his good graces? Those were the words she used. And I said, it's not about you. It's about a God that's never let you go, never forsook you. The call of God's grace is on your life, and it's been on your life the entire time. It has nothing to do with you. Don't we sing that in our church? Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths it may, its flow may richer, fuller be. And when I said that to this lady, she stopped and began to weep and said, oh, that's all I needed. I've forgotten that God loves me with an everlasting love, that he'll never abandon me or forsake me. Jonah went in the exact opposite direction of God. He was a prophet of God. And he said, I'm not doing it anymore. And God intervened and took his heart. So note, first of all, 
the call of grace this morning. Secondly, note the flight of man. The flight of man. God called Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh, and in doing so, God was going to display his grace to the world. We all know how Jonah responded. God told Jonah to arise, and he, he arose all right, except he went in the wrong direction. I could show you a map just how opposite the direction was. Just trust me, it was the opposite direction from Nineveh. Nineveh was located in what's today modern-day Mosul in Iraq. Jonah set sail for Tarshish, which is a city located in modern-day Spain. And that day, Tarshish was as far as the known world existed. So you've got to ask yourself, why did Jonah flee like this? He was an ordained prophet of God. Could it be it was a dangerous mission? It was. There's no denying that. These guys were the sworn enemy of Israel. So maybe he was afraid. This was a violent and wicked city. Frank Page says, talks about Nineveh this way. Archaeology confirms the biblical witness to the wickedness of the Assyrians. They were well known in the ancient world for brutality and cruel, cruelty. Ashurbanipal, the grandson of Sennacherib, was accustomed to tearing off the lips and hands of his victims. Tiglath Pileser flayed victims alive and made great piles of their skulls. Jonah's reluctance to travel to Nineveh may have been due to its infamous violence. And I say that because many of us give in or compromise because of fear. Fear of losing our job or worldly fail failure, fear of what other people think about us. That's a reason, but that's probably not the reason Jonah fled. We actually found, find what motivated Jonah in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. Jonah had developed this hatred for Nineveh and what they had done to Israel. It was so bad in his mind that he was not willing to go there. Jonah 4, 2 says this, And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and, a, and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Do you know what that verse says? Jonah was repulsed by the very grace of God. He was not afraid of failing his mission. He was afraid of succeeding in his mission. He was not happy about the thought that the Ninevites might actually hear the gospel and repent of their sins. In short, Jonah was a racist. He said, I don't want to go. I don't want anything to do with those dirty, rotten pagans. This is a serious issue, and it afflicts every single one of us because this is the issue of self-righteousness. At the center of our hearts, this is the deep issue. We need to feel superior to other people. We need to feel superior so we can feel good about ourselves. It is the nature of the human heart. The more we feel better about, uh, the more we feel uh, about other people, the better we feel about ourselves. Jonah's form of self-righteousness was, was in this fact that the Jewish race was superior to the Assyrians. Now, it could be that he thought the Israelites were good people and the Ninevites were really bad people. That sounds familiar. What kind of God would love the people that have done all those kinds of atrocities that God would show grace to people like that? Jonah wanted his God to hate the people he hated and love the people he loved. That's what's going on here. How are we supposed to show grace to people of ISIS? Or if you're a, a Democrat, why should I love a Republican? Or a Republican, why should I love a Democrat? Why should God show love on these people? Jonah's thinking, I'd rather have all the Assyrians that have been born on this planet to burn in hell forever than take the gospel of grace to, to them. That's what Jonah thinks. And so he runs. He runs to get away from God. Now, Jonah was a good theologian. He knew about the omnipresence of God. He knew that God was everywhere, but he was trying to get away from him relationally. Today in the 21st century, we meet people in the church, see people run away from God, run away from the church all the time. I bet every single one of us knows people or have family members that have left the church, and it hurts. And what hurts about it is this. We know how the story is going to end. If God doesn't intervene, they're going to crash and burn. Running from God at first seems like no big deal, but it always gets you in the end. I remember many years ago now when I was up in South Carolina, uh, we were getting ready for our annual mud bowl in the student ministry, and we had this huge mud pit in the back of the property, and I, was t I took my young oldest son, John Craig, who was about eight, nine years old, something like that. Uh, we had to move the hose as we were getting the, the mud bowl ready for this mud, big mud fight we were going to have. 
and we, we, I have a Honda Accord, which was a stick shift, and it was on top of this hill. It sloped a little bit down and then got steeper and steeper, and John Craig was in the passenger seat. I said, John Craig, stay in the car. I'm just going to move the hose. I'll be right back. Stay in the passenger seat. Keep your seatbelt on. Do all those kind of things. And the first thing that John Craig did when I got out of the car was he jumped out of the car, jumped into the driver's seat, and accidentally knocked the clutch into neutral. And so the car began to roll. And I did my best Usain Bolt impression <laughs> and sp as fast as I could, which was really slow. And I, was running, I ran towards that car, and I got in that car, and I could see John Craig's face. He was terrified. And as soon as I got in the car and stopped it before it went down the deep end of the hill, because it would have headed into a bunch of trees, I said, John Craig just started bawling. Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know I did wrong. I know I did wrong. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He kept saying it. And it, that illustration reminds me of how sin is so enticing. He really wanted to get in the driver's seat but it leads to destruction, just like that. That's where Jonah was headed. That's where Jonah was going. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it end leads to destruction and death. Ever since the fall, man has been running from God. Lots of people come to church who claim to be believers, but in reality are not true followers of Jesus Christ because Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus comes to Jonah and said, I want you to follow me. I want you to go to Nineveh. Are you a follower of Jesus this morning? God called Jonah to go, and Jonah said, but God, verse 3. If you but God, he's going to do what? Verse 4, he's going to butt you back, which leads to our third and last point. Note the call of grace, the flight of man, and thirdly, the pursuit of God. The pursuit of God, and by pursuit of God, I mean God's pursuit of us, not our pursuing God. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarsus. Then we get to verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. If you get in a fight with God, who do you think is going to win the tussle in the long end? Jonah fled from the Lord, but the Lord would not let him go. God wanted Jonah to do something, and Jonah was going to do it. You may or may not have heard of the British poet Francis Thompson who wrote a piece that describes Jonah's situation down to a T, that great poem, The Hound of Heaven. We sometimes call God the Hound of Heaven. It tells of God's undaunted pursuit of the man who flees him. He says this at first, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the aches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine of ways. That sums up Jonah's life as he fled from the presence of God. But it's not possible for those who belong to God to flee from him. Thompson goes on, he says this, Still with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet. That's God. Jonah gets on a boat, and he thinks he's got away from God. He goes to sleep on the boat. Maybe he didn't have to preach to those hated Nivenites at all. But God had other plans, so he sends the storm. He sends the storm into our lives often to get our attention. John Calvin writes about it this way. He says, Not by chance, but by the certain purpose of God, so that being overtaken on the sea, Jonah acknowledged that he'd been deceived when he thought he could flee away from God's presence by passing over the sea. The psalmist writes, Where can I flee from your presence, O Lord? If I go to the depths, you are there. If I go to the highest mountain, you are there. So here's the deal. Storms come our way whether we're believers or not. And as believers, God gives us storms to help us see our own foolishness. If we would but just understand this. But when the storms come, we often question God, don't we? God, how can you love me when I just lost my job or just lost my spouse? How can you say you love me when the love of my life just broke up with me? He does it to help you see your foolishness. Would you rather be a Romans 1 person? The person that defies God and ultimately God just gives them over to the desires of their flesh and the lust of their flesh, the desires of their heart. It is the grace of God that he intervenes in our lives. It is the grace of God that stopped Paul on the road to Damascus in his tracks. Now I know several of you in this room can relate to this by your conversion. You've either come to faith in jail or you lost your way somehow and God broke through and changed you. God uses life crisis is to get our attention do you see this there is mercy in the storm there is grace in the storm i'm not saying it's easy I might be getting a little ahead of myself but you know what happens to jonah the guys in the boat throw him in the storm they throw him into the very wrath of god but he doesn't die god makes provision for him 
What happens if you throw yourself into the wrath of God when you say, I am a sinner justly deserving his displeasure? God makes provision for you. Why? Because of the second Jonah. Jesus himself said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man must be in the earth for three days. He was thrown into the wrath of God, and he actually sunk to the bottom of the sea. He took the wrath of God that we deserve to make provisions for us so when the storms of life come our way, we can survive, not only survive, but thrive as we repent of our sin, look to God for forgiveness, and to clothe us with his righteousness. God will do what is necessary to shepherd his church. It might be the loss of a relationship or or a crushing job setback or a deadly illness. It may be the sickening of your soul. Your conscience is plagued as you realize you're avoiding God's will for your life. But if you're a believer this morning, you will never succeed ultimately in fleeing from God because at the time of God's choosing, he will come back in your life and and act in your life with pinpoint accuracy. Thompson, at the end of his poem, The Hound of Heaven, says it this way, All which I took from thee I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. All which thy child's mistake fancies is lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. That's what God wants us to do, to come. Jonah's a story of sin and unbelief and God's amazing grace. God using a person that's a fallen, broken person. It's a story that reminds us that we ought to respond to the grace of God when he brings the storms our way and and calls us to repentance and to new obedience. There was a um, a woman who adopted a child. She wasn't married, but adopted this child, this young boy, who came to her severely damaged and been abused time and time again beforehand. He'd be a delight one moment and fly into a fit of rage the next. He would hurl himself into a wall or into people. When that happened, this mom would often pin the young boy to the ground and hold him there with all her strength, and she would say things like, you're now mine. You belong to me. I'm never going to let you go. I love you. I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. When Jesus Christ got into a boat in the Gospels, And this huge storm came up, and he was sleeping, and the disciples woke him up and said, Jesus, we don't want to perish. And he simply says, hush, be still. When the storms of life come your way, do you look to Jesus to say, hush, be still. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have called you my child. You are mine. Please, please come back to me. Repent of your sin and listen to my direction, my will for your life. That's what God did with a prophet named Jonah. He can do it in our lives as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you this morning for your goodness and grace and mercy. I thank you for the life of Jonah because it so encourages us that, God, you use broken and finite people. I ask that we'd use this sermon for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we continue to celebrate God's gift of his faithful leadership to his people. We thank him at Redeemer for the elders and deacons that have been supplied over the years, the 20-some years that we've had a church. We thank those that have completed their terms of office, and we praise God for providing their successors. God's love for his church is seen in providing godly men, leaders, elders and deacons in his church. The Lord himself appoints these leaders, and by his Spirit he equips them so believers may grow in faith, develop Christian character, serve others in selfless love, and share with all the good news of salvation. He taught us the true spirit of leadership in Matthew chapter 20, where he says, Whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Elders serve by governing the church in Christ's name. They received this task when Christ entrusted his apostles and given them the keys to the kingdom in Matthew chapter 16. Elders are responsible for the spiritual well-being of God's people to provide true preaching and regular celebration of the sacraments, faithful counsel, discipline with people when they're needed, and keep in confidence matters held and entrusted to them. And they must provide fellowship and hospitality among believers, ensure good order in the church, and and stimulate witness to all people. 
Deacons serve by showing mercy to the church and all his people. They receive this task in Acts chapter 6 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. In Christ's name, deacons are to relieve victims of injustice. They are to, to administer mercy and help the shut-ins and widows. They're to speak words of Christian encouragement. The task of elder and deacon call for believers who are Christ-like, who are mature in the faith, who exercise their offices with prayer, patience, and humility. So this morning, we intend to ordain and install our new deacon, Steve Papadopoulos. He's never served as a deacon, I don't think, in any church. And install Dale Oka and reinstall, who's been off um, out of the office for a couple of years, even though he's an elder. So I'm going to ask those guys to come forward. And next week, we'll vote on continu the continuation of both Bob Curtis and Brad Fletcher for the class of 2022 as well. I'm going to ask you the following questions, Steve. I've asked you these questions before, and Dale, you can just affirm them. You've already accepted these, but you can affirm them again. Do you believe that in the call of this con do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God himself is calling you to these holy offices? Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will on your own initiative make known to your session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? Do you accept the office of ruling elder or, and deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer? Do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? And do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, unity, and edification of this church? To the congregation, I ask you this question. Do you members of this church Acknowledge and receive these brothers as ruling elders and deacons, and you promise to yield to them all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles him? If so, raise your right hand and say, I will. In the first chapter of Joshua, the leadership of the country was passed down from Moses to Joshua. How can anybody in their right mind want to take over Moses' duties. His feats for the Lord truly are legendary, and yet someone had to fill his shoes, and that man was Joshua. In Joshua 1, God tells Joshua there are going to be some difficult times in the future, and he says, do not forget where you've come from, whose you are, and what I've done for you. For 40 years, Moses had led the people through miracle after miracle. Now it was his turn, and now it's your turn taking the mantle. We've seen a lot of miracles take place at this church at Redeemer over the years. Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? I charge you not to forget what God has done and what he is doing and what he will do. That you be men of God, real men of God when no one else is looking. That you be in the word, that you be prayer warriors, that you be passionate for Jesus, which is our motto above everything else, even more than the flock, even more than this church. Acts 20:28 20, says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. He starts with, pay careful attention to yourself. How goes it with your family? How goes it with your wife? How goes it with your children? How goes your walk with the Lord that you would be passionate about Jesus Christ above everything else, that you'd grow in him and be growing in him that you would cultivate your relationship with God. And because you're passionate for Jesus, then you will go out and pursue people, people in this church. I charge you to guard yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. By word and example, bear up God's people in their pain and weaknesses. Celebrate their joys with them. Hold and trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage the aged to persevere in God's promises. Know the scriptures. 
which are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And pray for this church. Pray for me. Pray for the other elders and deacons of this church that God would, be, would find us faithful to him. To the congregation, I want to read this verse to you, Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be a no advantage to you. I charge you to receive these as God's office bearers of this church. Recognize them as the Lord's provision for your personal life. Hold them in high honor. Take their counsel seriously. Respond to them with obedience and respect. Accept their help with thanks. Sustain them in prayer. Encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of this office because the burdens do come. Acknowledge them as the Lord's servants among you. Will you do that? If so, say, I will. At this time, I'm going to ask the elders that are present, we're going to come lay hands on, on these two men. If you'll come over here and just kneel. to pray for us at this time. <coughs> Heavenly Father, it is a heavy responsibility to be an officer in a church as we've just heard from Pastor Craig's charge that uh, we have responsibilities to tend to our personal lives and our families. We have responsibilities to serve those that have called us in, their, in our local church. Uh, and we do not approach this task lightly or in our own strength, Lord, because we know that it is you who equip those that you have called. And so I pray, Lord, this morning for Stephen and for Dale, that you will equip them with a special measure of grace, that you will give them the, the Holy Spirit pouring into their hearts and lives to enable them to serve this congregation well to fulfill the responsibilities for officers that you lay out in your holy scriptures, that they will be active and selfless in serving those that, as, as we know, leadership in the church is not a matter of high position or lording authority over others, but rather being a servant to all. We thank you so, Lord, so much, Lord, for the provision of leadership in this church, uh, not only among the officers that already serve, but in raising up new officers, and so in particular today as we think about the ordination of Steve Papadopoulos. We just thank you, Lord, that you are always active in your church, continually raising up men who are able and willing to serve. We pray now that as he embarks upon this journey that you will be with him in a, in a special way. We thank you so much for the bonds of fellowship that unite our community of believers. We do pray that you would enable us to have a spirit of unity, that we would proceed together to do your work whether it is through worship or encouragement of believers or reaching out to the lost in the community around us, that all these things that we would do for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who called us together as his people and for whose glory we do all things. We pray these things in his name. Amen. We extend to you the right hand of fellowship to take part in this office with us. I pronounce and declare that Dale Holkrein has been regularly elected and installed as a ruling elder in this church, that Steve Papadopoulos has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed as a deacon in this church, agreeable to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such they are entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together as we close.
The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son. Who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. See your blood. Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. your perfect sacrifice I've been brought here your enemy you've made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness know no end your blood has washed away my sin Jesus Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul I want to live for you lover of my soul I want to live for you lover of my soul I want to Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. A reminder, if you want to stay for the... Uh, the children's ministry uh, report with Amber here after the service. Come back in the sanctuary really quickly for the quick meeting. As well as if you want to come to the discovery class and know more about the church, come to that. And, and come to the congregational meeting next week. And now receive the benediction from God. And now may the love of God and the grace of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, this week, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.